watching. Yes, today I want to give you a nice um, introduction to project three. I think it's going to be a very um, interesting project for you to do, and I hope you are really going to enjoy it. And so the whole idea of this project is to teach you best practices and standards, how to write the best possible code that is loosely coupled, maintainable, and will be available um, you know, in a production environment for a long time to come, as you are going to be writing it in such a way that um, it's sufficient. And um, you know, we want to do that. That's what we as professional software developers want to do, is we want to make sure that our code um, is not going to cause frustration to those who come after us or, with, or those who work with us. So I first of all want to discuss dependency injection with you. I know we've done it in project two. Um, some of you may be wondering about it. How does it work and what is it really? And I want to discuss it with you just so that you understand a little bit more about loose coupling inside code. I want to discuss the repository button with you briefly that we are going to be doing in project three. And then I'm going to give you some ideas for project three on how to conceptually design your solution so that you can implement a repository pattern. And then on the class on um, the 15th of September, you will get more information about this project. Right, so let's say that the, what do we want to do here? We want to create loosely coupled code. And the reason why, and I'm stressing it again, this is such an important topic for software development, is that when you want to modify code in the one part of your application, you do not affect the other part. And you know, so that's so important. That's how these large organizations have crashed, you know, um, and, and they cannot get themselves up again because something small, some semicolon somewhere can cause a massive application to crash and you don't want to have that. Uh, you know, if we, we write spaghetti code and we write all these old fashioned, um, you know, these massive big applications had very often had that in and we don't do that. We write code that is very modular and that calls each other and that can really um, enhance uh, your productivity a lot. And it's really it's really resilient to change, you know, so if you make changes, you can you can do it with a comfortable um, feeling, you know, sometimes in, in industry, there are these bits of code that nobody wants to touch because they are so dangerous. You never know what it actually is doing. And what people then do is they just write wrappers around them and everything just grows and becomes worse. So you want to write code that is resilient to change and that can change. And so what we are going to discuss then in terms of this is the dependency injection um, pattern and the repository pattern. So when we look at dependency injection, there are two principles that sit behind it. The one is called inversion of control and the other one is called dependency inversion principle. And together they have been combined into the dependency injection pattern. So in a general object oriented environment, Classes have to be loosely coupled and you design them to be like that. So, um, and that's where we say the changes will not affect each other. So if I look at the basic um, sort of environment that we are looking at, we have a, you know, a user interface environment, we have a service, a business logic and the data access. And what we see um, in this and what we want to achieve is that we want to make sure we write code that is loosely coupled. And basically what we see here that, that, that there's a um, dependency between the user interface and the service, the service and the business logic and the business logic and the data access. But what I want to focus on here is the business logic data access uh, interaction. And we want to make sure, you know, because data can, for example, change um, and then it may affect our business logic or we want to change business logic, uh, whatever it is that we want to do. Um, and we want to make sure that this interaction is loosely coupled. OK, so if I should say that I now um, and I'm now looking at the inversion of control principle. Um, and it's first of all, you know, ask what do I mean by that? If I say control, what is it actually that I mean by that? So what I see here is I have a class here called customer business logic. I have another class here called data access. Um, and so what I see that I have in my uh, customer business logic, um, I have an instantiation of the data access clause. So I, my, what does my data access clause do? It actually just gets the customer information. So I have a, a customer logic clause that wants to use customer information and it is instantiates a clause. So what you see is this clause and this clause are linked to each other and there's actually a tight coupling between the two. 
And what I see here is that the data access clause is actually invoked by the customer business logic clause. It actually controls the creation of data. So data access can only be really sort of instantiated within this environment. And we can see here is the keyword new. So you can see this is where instances of data access is being created. Um, and therefore, you know, if you have many instances of this in other parts of code, you know, so all over the place, data access has been instantiated. It means that if anything should change, you know, where this instantiation occurs, many changes will have to happen in code. And there's a tight coupling between these classes that we want to um, get rid of. And the other problem is that, you know, can I test the customer business logic without testing data access at the same time? So in terms of testing, unit testing, this also causes a problem. So yeah, when I'm looking at just how these two classes have been done, um, I can see that, it, that it's going to cause maintenance problems. It's going to cause issues for me. I should get rid of it. OK, and so basically, you know, so what is the solution? Now, the solution is to change the way in which control happens. So the solution is don't call me, I will call you, you know, so you, you give control somewhere else. And so essentially what we now say is that the instantiation of the data access clause should actually be done somewhere else, not inside the business logic clause, OK? And so what we need to do, you know, so, so what I want to do is I want to get rid of that. I want to get rid of that there. And then I want to actually pass the control to somewhere else where the instantiation will happen. And if I do that, it means that if any, you know, like whenever this instantiation happens, if I put it in another place um, and I can just put it in one central place, it means that, um, you know, not many changes in code should happen when this instantiation should take place, like I've explained just now. And so essentially what I now need to do is I should rather depend, you know, this dependence should not be on an actual instantiation, but rather on an abstraction using some interface. So for example, if I can create an interface like get data access, um, it will actually solve this problem because then instantiation of an actual um, object will not happen here. And it also means then that I can actually replace that with any type of data access. So one day I'm using a SQL Server database, another time I'm going to be using a JSON uh, file or whatever it is, and I can easily change that because I don't have the actual instantiation here. So so this um, if now this is what inversion of control means is put the control somewhere else. Now for dependency injection, that's exactly what we do. We put the control for instantiating some something um, inside the actual container, as we know. Then the second principle is dependency inversion principle, which is one of the solid principles which you have to implement in your project. And so it says here that high level modules should not depend on low level modules. They should depend on the abstraction. And the second thing is that abstraction should not depend on details. Details should depend on abstraction. So here we see this is how, you know, the, the um, sort of example that I was showing you here, this is with our dependency inversion. So what I see here is a high level module is dependent on a low level module. It's exactly what I'm showing you in this, this case here. And then secondly, you know, you know, um, the abstraction, there's not really abstraction here, you know. And so basically with dependency inversion, what do we see here? We now see here that there's now an interface that has been created, the repository interface that is now enabling us to access our database. And what we see, the business logic is not dependent on something down here, but actually on this interface on the same level. So we meet that requirement. Okay, and we also see here that the SQL database you know, is, is inheriting that interface there. So then this will basically, the in dependency inversion principle, it, in other words, you are changing the level of dependency um, is actually su successfully applied by um, this design here. So you can see that the interface that I put here will solve the problems for me. Okay, now dependency injection, um, you know, is what we are looking at. So basically what we see is that you can you can adhere to the inversion control, but still violate the dependency inversion principle, okay? 
because inversion of control does not say anything about high or low level modules. Okay, so so that means that you know the this design is also very important. It's not just a question of handling control somewhere else, you know, that you can then invoke through this interface, but it's also a question of, of, of structuring it into the right levels. And that is what dependency injection says for us. So what is different now with dependency injection is that you ask for an instance of your class that is in the dependency injection framework, and it will then instantiate one, and it will inject those instances into, in our case, where we, we, what we were doing is we were using controllers. So when we sort of, um, you know, instantiate our controller, it will ask the dependency injection framework, and then it will give you an instantiation of what you want, um, and then um, it will inject it into your um, environment. So the instantiation of, of what you need is actually done inside that framework. And frameworks like Spring and ASP.NET, MVC Core, and many others have this built in. It is a very formal and a standard part of the whole environment. And it is something that you actually can't bypass as a software developer. It is something that you should be using. So how do we know when we should use this sort of environment is, first of all, and again, I think I've already mentioned this is that, first of all, you need if you need to reference a low level module from a high level module, you know that there's a problem that you need to fix this. You need to get rid of that because it's going to cause maintenance problems. If you find it hard to add or replace a low level part like a database access, so you want to change. And this is where the repository button also helps us, you know, you want to change into some other data source and you are struggling to do that, then you know. I have to change this in a different way in how I code it. If you find it hard to unit test a high level component due to the dependencies of the low level classes, you know I have a problem. I must fix my code. And if you have the new um, word all over the place, um, you know, then you also know that I have to change the way in which I work. Because the code is not working with abstractions, but with concrete implementations all over the show. That is a problem that we need to address. OK, so summarizing, if you look at dependency injection, it is a design pattern. Um, it uses two principles, inversion of control, which means, you know, give the control somewhere else to instantiate something and dependency inversion principle, which says look at high and low level, um, you know, directions of dependency. Those two principles are applied in the dependency injection pattern. And the framework that handles this for us is the inversion of control container, or we also call it the dependency injection framework. So essentially how this framework would work is, let's say, if class A uh, is dependent on class B, class A will have to create an instance of class B. Now, instead of class A invoking that or creating the using the new word, the uh, keyword to do it, it's actually now going to say, to um, the environment, I will say, I need objects A and B, give it to me. And then your dependency injection framework is gets, yes, sure. I will create class A and B for you, and I will pass it to you. And that is essentially what's happening. So if you think about what is the word inject, so the, who injects what? So the container creates the objects and injects it back into where it is being asked from. So, and then in ASP.NET Core, you know, dependency injection is uh, built into the framework and you as a developer should make use of it. It really enhances the way in which your code is um, used then. Right, let's have a look at an example then on how this would work. Okay, for example, let's look at this uh, controller. Here we have home controller that inherits from controller. And then there is an action um, index action method and this, as you can see, like I've explained just now, here we see the new keyword. In other words, what's happening is that um, the product service is instantiated inside this code, making this code difficult to maintain, not loosely coupled, not easy to test, and so forth. And we need to fix this, okay? So what we now say is also that, okay, the, the other problem that we say is, let's say we want to create another uh, service called the beta. Okay, here you can see we are using product service. So some product service is being created, but we now want to replace it with better product service, some other code that we want to write. 
Um, and so how can we do that? So what you'll have to then do is you'll have to, if you're going to be using this approach, you're going to have to instantiate product service with better product service. And let's say you're doing that in 10 or 20 places in code, you'll have to do it in 10 or 20 places, replacing the code with new code. Uh, if you want to do a testing of uh, uh, not, you know, better product service, but with test product service in the testing environment only, and product service in the production, it's a very difficult thing to do. Again, many changes in code, uh, management of, of versions of code is very important then. And so product service can then, for example, depend on another service and another service and so forth. And a lot of chains of dependencies can exist inside code. I mean, I'm only showing you one example here where one um, class is dependent on another one, but it could be a whole a chain reaction that is happening there. And that could cause many issues. So therefore, dependency injection solves all these problems. You know, so the, so what I'm trying to show you here, um, you know, it's just that I want to make code that is very efficient and easy to change. And I'm going to do this by layering. And I'm going to move things away from each other. And I'm really going to, um, you know, think about what I'm doing and not just blindly go and write my code and leave it to others later to change and update and really get frustrated with what I've done. Right, so dependency then injection is a design pattern that does not create dependent classes, but rather just asks for it. Okay, so when we are looking at our code, and this code then here has um, now been um, written with dependency injection in mind. And so what we are then saying is you do not see the new keyword at all. So basically what happens is, when we are doing the constructor of the home controller, we are asking, you can see here, and this is where the ask happens. I want to, um, you can see I specify my interface product service, and this is what I want. I want product service. Um, and I'm now going to be using that. And you can then see that in my action method, that is going to be, the product service is going to be used as a, as an actual class that is going to be used by whatever methods are available. And so the instance um, is going to be created somewhere else. So you can see there is no instance that is actually now created using the new keyword. Okay. And so the responsibility for that um, of creating the product service is inside the dependency injection container um, that we need then have um, that will do that for us. Okay. So how are, and, and this is then how the dependencies are injected. Um, you know, I've already explained that, um, how that is done. Okay, and how do we do it? Basically, you'll have to write a class and then you have to configure in the startup class. You have to go and configure um, the environment to know about what you uh, wanted to know. And this is where we have then the services.add transient. And here's your interface product service iProduct service, and here is the actual instantiation of whatever it is that you want to have passed back to you. And so we are using the transient um, keyword here. It could also be add singleton add scope, but basically transient is the one that is most commonly used. It means that for every request that I'm going to pass through, you know, for the lifetime of that request, give me a new instance of the object. And that is then the, quite a safe way of doing that. And the object will be then available for that request lifetime. Okay, here is just sort of a diagram to then illustrate in a visual way what is happening. Okay, so when the new home controller is requested, the MVC will ask the dependency injection framework, which you can see over here, to provide an instance of the home controller class. And then the dependency, uh, obviously, with the parameters that are provided, and then the dependency injection container will ins inspect the constructor then and determine what are the dependencies. So it sees, okay, this is what you want from what was available in your um, constructor um, that you passed me. It will then search through the dependencies using the dependency resolver, and it will then find it, as you can see here, two services have been registered, product service and better product service. So the one that is uh, chosen then in this case, product service will then be passed back and an instantiation of the object will be passed back. And this is where obviously then this occurs. And so 
the uh, home controller just asks and instantiation happens here and the object is passed or the instance of the object is passed uh, that way. And so um, that is then how this whole environment works. So what you can see here is that, you know, the control now sits over here to actually be instantiating these instances. OK, so if I now want to decide, let me change what um, class is now going to be instantiated. I do not, you know, before we said that the new keyword would be all over your code, but it's not actually the case now anymore. It's just, well, it's actually nowhere to be seen, but the container is handing that function for me. But let's say I want to change um, that product service into better product service or into test product service, whatever it is you want to change. So what you now basically just have to do is you create a class for whatever it is that you want to do. In this case, I want to create a class for better product service. I'm now going to into the configure services. I'm going to now configure it to say that what I want here is better product service. And I do not have to go to the controllers or anywhere else to make my changes. The code will stay the same. It changes in one place only in one central location. And so everything is then handled from here. Right, so that shows you how much more um, efficient your code will be. You will not have to make changes inside code, but you just change your configure services in the startup to then point to the right place. In, in uh, the example we did in our project, in project two, many people, you all saw the DB context that we are using and how that worked is that we basically created a class here to access our database. Uh, in this case, I called it products DB context, inheriting from DB context, and we used uh, dependency injection to handle this for us. And in the startup, we then configured it. We said in the startup, we configure our services with a DB context, and here we then specified the actual um, instantiation of what we are busy with, with a certain connection string. And so that is how you saw it in our actual um, implementation. And then um, our cons you can see here, then our controller could then use it. And here we see our controller did not use the new keyword to actually instantiate um, our products DB context. You know, um, it um, when 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 this was instantiated, the 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 category controller was instantiated. It knew this is what was required, and then you could see then uh, we are using it in in terms of we we we've got this context here. We are using the categories table. Yeah, so therefore you can also see that is how it was used um, inside our um, project two with a, a dependency injection. Right, so that just gives us a little picture of what dependency injection is and and in how this whole uh, design pattern helps us to write more loosely coupled code. Now that's just a sort of a concept that you must now keep in mind. So when we now continue to the repository pattern, it's a different pattern, but you've now you understand what's happening with dependency injection and you understand that um, you are changing the control of how uh, classes control each other and you're handing over to a container the responsibility of doing instantiation of instances and thereby doing that, you ensure that your code um, is better maintainable. Okay, now repositories are classes or components that let us access data sources. Now you can see over here, there are many types of data sources that we can access, many different types of tables in a database, or different types of you know, information, JSON files that you, for example, could store in a Mong MongoDB file a database, XML files, or CSV files. And so what we want to do is we want to separate from the logic. We want to separate um, it from the actual data access, the nitty gritties of that, decouple it so that it is more maintainable. And this is what you will be implementing in project three, is, is the separation that we want. Okay, so the repository pattern is then as an abstraction layer that sits um, between the data access layer and the business logic, creating more loosely coupled environments. So if you do not have the repository pattern in, in and this is how our application that we are going to give to you will look. You know, you've, you, you have the web server calling your controllers, 
which interact with the DB context, calling out actual data. And so you can see that the actual application is tightly coupled to the call to the database. With a repository pattern, what we do is we separate those two layers. So it's about layering, and then we call our data. So this is the layer that we want you to add to your project. Right, so let's practically look at what we want you to do. So if you open the um, on the on our on the repo uh, that is provided to you in the brief of project three, you are going to get a project there that you can then install on your computer, and this is what it will have. It will have the a model view controller MBC pattern implemented already, and there will be folders available where you'll be able to see this. And then on a file level, what we see here is we see the DB context file and the startup file. And, and, and we know that dependency injection is being implemented here. Um, you know, um, that um, your access to your database is then con sort of controlled by the container. Um, and so this is what we will see available at this layer. So what do we want you to do for project three? This is essentially what you, we want you to go towards, okay? So um, basically we now change our folder and file structure so that we will have, now remember that what we want, if you look at the brief of project three, we want you to use the repository pattern to access the controllers, or to access, not the controllers, to access the data for the devices uh, table, the zone table, and the categories table. So you need many repositories, okay? And so, and you'll also need to have a data, so you, you're gonna add a new folders. You're gonna have the model view controllers, they will stay the same, but you're gonna create a new folder for your repositories that you're gonna be having and your data. Okay, so basically what we we'll, we'll re we require is that you have a folder for your repositories and this will, now remember that's where we say we are using um, the different principles that we've discussed. And so we will say that we, um, to be able to, uh, your controller needs to uh, call a repository class that is going to now um, access whatever table you are busy with. But we know that in the controller, like we've explained before, we know that in the controller, we don't want to start with a new class, with a new keyword. And this sort of whole thing here will be handled for you in any case by your dependency injection uh, container, like we normally did. So, so your, um, uh, you know, you're gonna you're going to um, register your DB context inside, um, you know, the, the container with in the startup class, like you would normally do, as you can see over here. And we would prefer to use then here the transient. Um, scope that we uh, the life cycle that we want to implement per request and so you'll be implementing you know the normal dependency injection in any case but but what you have to break out is your folder structure and in your under your folder structure will be the repository interface that instantiates your repository class so that will be a level that you have to introduce there and now in our case we are only going to be using db context because we are only working with our sql database but let's say as an example that you are also calling data via other services or via a NoSQL database, then in those cases you would have had more, um, you know, um, in files that are sitting here that will be able to let you do that. But in our case, under this, we are only using the DB context really to be able to do that. And we have our repository folder that is going to point to all the different repositories that we are going to be needing. So, so this essentially is how your structure of your, um, you know, project is going to be looking like uh, for project three. And then finally, just a last point is then uh, when you implement, it's another best practice is just keep your controllers slim and clean. In other words, don't have inside a controller a lot of code. You know, so. A controller is just sort of a, a routing point. You know, if you think about what a controller is, I get a call from my web server. It routes me to, in this case, it's going to be routing me to a get. So I'm going to get a product in this case. And then from here, um, you know, so, so this is just a point of contact into the application. From here, I should actually not 
be writing. Now, here I've just got two lines, but it could be many lines of code that are going to be sitting here. So the whole idea is I don't want to put my code in here inside the actual um, controller. What I want to do is I want to write a component or a function that is going to be invoked where the main code will be sitting. It could also, in that case, be a reusable component. And I want to make sure that my controller is easy to maintain. So I don't want to, you know, look at controllers when I'm busy maintaining code. I want to look at where functions are actually being implemented. So a better approach would be that um, inside the controller, I'm going to just have here when the when you're going to say I want to do a get, I'm just going to say, okay, well, call this get product and apply discount. I'm going to call that. And that's the only place where, um, you know, that's the only line of code I have here. And then if I have 100 lines of code, it will be sitting in there. And so then if something has to change, I have to go into this specific function, go and change it there. And I don't have to all the time. And, you know, it's, it becomes reusable. So this specific function could also be sitting in another application, not in an API, for example, but in a normal, um, you know, standalone application that um, can be using the same function. So you want to make reusable code and you don't then put it in here because it then is tightly coupled only to this environment, but you want to break it out so that it can also be used in other environments. Right, so that's then basically all from my side about um, this, and then I hope that this will help you to actually structure projects through a little bit better.